Hello, my name is John Jackson. I'm Dean of the Annenberg School for Communication here at the University of Pennsylvania. And it is my pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to today's important all day symposium, Black Media Makers. I have to admit, I've been personally anticipating this for a very long time, partly because my own point of entry into the academy was at the nexus, I think, where media making, for me, for me particularly filmmaking, meets contemporary social theorizing and scholarship. And so trying to find spaces where we can talk critically and carefully, substantively, and in a sophisticated way about what media making even entails in the contemporary moment, to me, is vital. Um, and so I'm very excited that the Center for Media at Risk and Media Inequality and Change have come together to coordinate this incredibly vital all-day symposium. Sarah J. Jackson, who is the scholar who really took the lead in conceptualizing and operationalizing this idea, has framed this as a kind of tripartite discussion. It's both a conversation to be had about the state of Black media today across various industries, about the specific experiences, like what have Black media makers lived, what have they had to deal with, that could be useful for us to understand as we think about not just the past and the present, but the future of Black media making. And then how do we find a way to really talk in a careful and useful way about the challenges faced by Black media makers today, especially in the context of such a hyper-polarized contemporary American public sphere? So if nothing else, my hope is that you all who are probably coming at this conversation from a lot of different intellectual, academic, and non-scholarly domains and vantage points find different ways to hold on to what I think are going to be a series of really crucial discussions to be had, um, information to be shared, and hopefully knowledge to be translated into really important ways of reimagining what Black media making can be in the 21st century. So I want to thank the team for putting this together. Um, I look forward to the conversations, and I hope this is something that we build on in the future as we continue to think critically about what media making is, how to think about the ties between conceptualizing or theorizing our media landscape and producing media content that really matters and matters in ways that make people's lives better. Um, so welcome again. Have a fantastic day with us, and hopefully you'll each get something out of it be able to take away. Thank you for that generous intro, Dean Jackson, and welcome to everyone. I'm Sarah Jackson, Presidential Associate Professor at the Annenberg School for Communication. We are so thrilled to have around 200 participants registered for today, which I believe really reflects the need and timeliness of this event. In the midst of this often difficult year, I became the co-director of the Media Inequality and Change Center at the Annenberg School for Communication. And I want to first thank my co-directors, Victor Picard and Todd Wolfson, for hearing an early version of this idea and basically saying, absolutely do it. I am also incredibly grateful to the Mike Center program manager, Briar Smith, for all her work to make this happen, and the co-sponsorship and support of the Center for Media at Risk, under the leadership of Barbie Zelizer and coordination of Emily Plowman and Joanna Bergner. There are, of course, many others I could thank for feedback, spitballing, and even playlist making for this event as it became clear we'd need to get creative to take what started as a multi-day in-person idea in my head to a hopefully we won't keep you on Zoom too long COVID era event. On that account, I so appreciate the whole Annenberg School IT team and Jeff Hamill, who is producing behind the scenes today. Before we jump into our first all-star panel, I want to share a bit about what inspired me to organize this event. I, of course, took the subtitle for today's event, The Fierce Urgency of Now, from Martin Luther King's speech at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963. This year has shown us that urgency has not subsided the COVID-19 pandemic, the economic downturn resulting from it have disproportionately affected Black communities and other communities of color. And the value of Black life, as we saw through the uprisings this summer, continues to need to be asserted. 
I myself studied journalism, both in my undergraduate and graduate education and dabbled a bit, but primarily I'm a scholar who admires those who make media. My first book examined the black press um, in especially important moments of celebrity activism and social change. And more recently, I spent time researching how social media is used by black storytellers to contribute to political and activist debates. I've been lucky enough to be included in black media spaces from the National Association of Black Journalists to Post Bougie. And I've observed the frustration many black media makers feel with the imaginative limitations and archaic norms of mainstream industries. At the same time, black owned and run media are faced with limited resources and often given less attention than their mainstream counterparts. Earlier this year, I received a Carnegie Fellowship to pursue a book project I've long dreamed of writing on the power and innovation of black media makers in the 21st century. There is important documentation of this historically, of course, from Freedom's Journal, America's first black newspaper, which was founded decades before the abolition of slavery, to Ida B. Wells' dogged truth telling about lynching at the turn of the 20th century, to the role of black newspapers and radio in the civil rights era, and to, and of course this one still hurts, the remarkable contributions of Gwen Eiffel to political journalism. This history and so much more shapes the everyday lives of not just today's black media makers, but those of every member of this nation. Yet my own book is not a history of this past, but a snapshot of the present with the goal of especially documenting the contributions of black media makers across platforms and genres in this moment and considering the remarkable rise of black millennial media makers among others. I'd argue that the rise to visibility of the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, and the measurable ways it and other national debates about race have affected US culture and politics in the years since have been supported by an information ecosystem in which black media makers have more reach and autonomy than ever before. The 2020 Pulitzer Prize Committee, for example, posthumously recognized Ida B. Wells, but they did not wait to recognize the contributions of Nicole Hannah-Jones, Colston Whitehead, Soraya McDonald, and other Black storytellers of the moment. Yet many Black media makers remain limited, not only by the same norms and structures that pushed their predecessors to the margins, but by new challenges related to mis- and disinformation, polarization, media consolidation, and bosses and organizations who not so long ago were determined that the nation was post-racial. Notably, the uprising for racial justice that erupted across the nation this summer extended to mainstream media organizations where sometimes for the first time black media makers went public with objections to how their white colleagues and editorial bosses chose to cover the Black Lives Matter movement, black resistance and issues of race generally. I'd say then that it is not just impressive, but audacious that so many of our panelists and other black media makers today are on the front lines of pushing media and technological innovation, of telling stories in increasingly multimodal and genre bending ways, of making us laugh while informing us, of shifting our aesthetic tastes and reminding us of the greater possibilities that exist for a nation when black truths are told. I think I've gone on too long. Uh, so I just wanna share some logistics before we jump into the first session. Today's symposium includes four sessions sandwiched on a, with a one, one hour lunch break. We hope you will eat. We hope you'll be able to join us for the day for all our important conversations. If you have questions for our panelists, you can pop them in the Q and A box. And if you see questions already there, you can upvote them. We'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of each session today, and we'll draw questions from there. With that, I'd like to introduce our first panel and first set of panelists. All righty. So in no particular order, Jean Demby is the co-host and correspondent for NPR's Code Switch team just named Apple's podcast of the year, so no big deal. Before coming to NPR, he served as the managing editor for Huffington Post Black Voices. Prior to that role, he spent six years in various positions at the New York Times. 
While working for the Times in 2007, he started a blog about race, culture, politics, and media called Post Bougie, which won the 2009 Black Weblog Award for Best News Politics Site. Welcome to Jean. Erin Haynes is a founding mother and editor at large for the 19th, a nonprofit, nonpartisan newsroom covering the intersection of women, politics, and policy, and an MSNBC contributor. An award winning political journalist focused on issues of race, gender, and politics, Erin was previously the Associated Press's national writer on race and ethnicity. She has also worked at the Washington Post, the Orlando Sentinel, and the Los Angeles Times. Maori Holmes is curator at large, Annenberg's Center for the Performing Arts, and the artistic director and CEO of, the Bla of Black Star Projects, which produces the widely acclaimed Black Star Film Festival and Scene, a journal of film and visual culture, as well as other programs. Welcome. And so with that, we are going to jump right in to uh, our questions here for for today. And, and I, one thing I want to note for everyone, um, both uh, in terms of our attendees and um, also for our panelists, is that we're really hoping that the conversation today will be casual. Uh, we don't need to be super formal. Um, and um, we really are hoping that you will exchange with each other, chat back and forth. And, um, you know, I, I sent all of our panelists a few prompts ahead of time to get us thinking about some of the questions that we may want to consider today, but by no means um, will we necessarily stick to those. Um, I think one characteristic often of, um, of black media and black media making um, and of black culture more broadly is that we sort of uh, get impromptu as needed. Um, so with that, I want to jump right in to our questions. Give me just one moment to clear my screen here. Sorry, all I have a little too many things open. There we go. Okay. Thanks for your patience. Um, all right, so this first panel is called Black in Media Now, and it assesses the state of recent media made by Black Americans amidst the promises and limitations of new technologies, um, the decline in certain media industries, the rise of others, as well as sort of the circumstances that ultimately affect the, the visibility of Black media makers and the stories that they are able to tell. So I want to start out by asking if each of you, and you can go in any order you, you feel, um, can share a bit about your own trajectory in terms of where you started in media and how you ended up where you are now, and maybe reflect a bit along the way on challenges that you think uh, Black media makers face, and at the same time, opportunities that they have in what has become a very rapidly changing set of media industries. Who wants to go first? <laughs> go for you. Go you. Uh, yeah, so I mean, yeah, how it started versus how it's going, right? Uh, hi, uh, first of all, thank you everybody for tuning in. Really appreciate it. And it is uh, awesome to be able to share the screen with a couple of my friends and now a new one, Maori. Hi, uh, nice to be Maybe. meeting you. Uh, but always good to be with Jean and, and, and Sarah. So, um, so yeah. Listen, I uh, am somebody who actually got my start in journalism in the black press. Uh, I am from Atlanta and my first, uh, I would say official newspaper job was uh, at the Atlanta Daily World uh, while I was still in college, a black newspaper that uh, was publishing a couple of times a week uh, and, and was the oldest at, at the time continuously publishing uh, black newspaper in the state. And you know that was really a formative experience for me just because I, uh, and, and the very small staff that we had, uh, you know, we were responsible for really kind of pounding the pavement in downtown Atlanta and coming up with, uh, you know, stories to fill that paper uh, twice a week. Uh, and, and they were about uh, Black folks, uh, Black folks who were in power uh, in my hometown uh, and who were, um, you know, doing things uh, in their community each and every day. And so having to figure out uh, what uh, stories we wanted to tell, uh, but, but, but always about uh, folks who looked like us and, and bearing witness for our community 
uh, figuring out at a fairly young age, uh, not only that those were stories worth telling, uh, but that those were stories that would, you know, go on the front page of the daily world, you know, and, at, at, you know, in my early 20s, you know, being on the front page of any newspaper was, you know, a big deal for me, but, but it also was a big deal to me that, that stories about our people uh, would be front page news, because that was not always the case, frankly, at, at the paper of record uh, in Atlanta, the Atlanta Journal Constitution, uh, and, and it's still not, in fact. But, uh, but, 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 but that, that was an important lesson for me to learn early on uh, that our stories were worth telling and, and that I should never really have to make the case for why stories about black folks and black life uh, were relevant uh, and newsworthy. Uh, and so that's something that I think I've carried with me throughout my career. Uh, even as uh, I went to uh, work at mainstream uh, legacy publications, uh, wanting to uh, lift up the voices of folks who had been, you know, too long unseen and unheard in our democracy and in our society uh, was something that was important for me, regardless of what my, you know, kind of official beat was. Uh, and so, uh, you know, whether that was at the Associated Press or at the Orlando Sentinel or at the Washington Post, uh, that was something that was a, a priority uh, for me. And, and I say that because you know, a lot of young journalists uh, are, are often told, you know, that, that, that uh, you know, covering race or focusing on race uh, is something that can potentially pigeonhole you in your career, right? Like that that is something that you should, you know, sure, I mean, maybe, you know, if they call on you to write about these issues or that if they call on you to weigh, on these, weigh in on these issues and by they, I mean, the white gatekeepers who are, you know, running uh, these, uh, a lot of these institutions, uh, that, that, that uh, you know, you should do that. But otherwise, you know, you don't want to focus on that uh, too much. And that was never really something that I subscribed to. Uh, you know, I have been somebody who's focused on covering the intersection of race in America um, officially and I mean, unofficially and then officially for, for most of my career. And I felt like that has only helped me, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, you know, my, my uh, ascendance in journalism. So, um, you know, I uh, did two, a couple of tours at the Associated Press, uh, first in my hometown uh, of Atlanta, where I've been an intern at the AP uh, in uh, the mid 2000s and then came back in um, 2012 uh, in Philadelphia, where uh, I'm now based uh, to, to write about, um, you know, uh, inequality and, and, and um, black folks in the, uh, what is the poorest big city in America. So, uh, you know, uh, a few years ago, got the job that I frankly had wanted since the time I'd been an intern, uh, became uh, the national writer on, on race and ethnicity for the Associated Press. And it was a huge, and tremendously rewarding uh, platform uh, for me to be able to tell uh, those stories and really whatever stories that I deemed uh, relevant and, and, and newsworthy uh, on, on the topic. Uh, and, and, you know, race, um, the intersection of race and politics became increasingly important as, as uh, you mentioned, Sarah, uh, you know, we certainly were nowhere near post-racial after 2008, right? We were, if, if, if anything, hyper-racial, right? Seeing the rise of the Tea Party and, and such. Uh, and so by the time uh, we get to 2016, um, you know, I'm covering an election where, you know, I'm seeing uh, racism and, 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 and racist, uh, you know, rhetoric and, and behavior happening uh, in this campaign and not enough political journalists, frankly, who knew what they were looking at. Uh, and so, you know, that was very interesting uh, because as somebody who had covered race for most of their career before pivoting to covering kind of that main intersection of race and politics, what I learned was that it was a lot easier for me uh, to learn how to cover politics than it was for a lot of the people who've been covering political journalism to, to uh, cover issues of race. Uh, and I think that you cannot cover uh, politics in this country at this point uh, without having a working knowledge of, of this country's racial history. Uh, and, and for folks who don't have that, uh, it, through their lived experience, uh, you know, catching up very quickly uh, is something that is going to continue to be uh, an asset, especially if uh, newsrooms are not going to diversify their political teams, uh, which is something that I was hoping was going to happen in 2020, but frankly did not happen. I don't think to the extent that it should have uh, in, 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 uh, headed into 2020, knowing that we have, you know, a historic number of women running, a historic number of people of color running for president. And so, um, you know, I truly believe that, um, you know, leaning into my lived experience, both in terms of my race initially, but now um, at the newsroom where I now work that I helped to start the 19th, uh, focusing on my race and my gender uh, have been assets to my journalism and not a liability. And that is what I tell young people, uh, you know, who are coming into this uh, and who, um, you know, frankly are experiencing, um, even as um, budding journalists, a lot of 
um, you know, what it is that we are writing about. Uh, you know, so that is an advantage that they have, that they are tapped into uh, that world, that they are tapped into those networks and that they, they can use that to tell uh, stories because I, you know, race is the unfinished work of our democracy and it truly is a story of our time. Thank you, so great. Thank you for that. Um, Miori or Jean? I can go. <laughs> um, so I have um, a bit of a, uh, I feel like it's sort of triangular now. I can see that 30 years later, but I've been going back and forth between um, the arts, um, primarily dance and theater and photography to some extent. And then I've had um, fits and starts with uh, professional communications, working in PR, working in the music industry. I worked as a journalist for a while. And then film has become the, I think the most public facing part of my career, but um, I've been going back and forth between all three of those spaces. And um, my first work was um, in the music industry, working for Dallas Austin. I went to high school in Atlanta, Aaron. So <laughs> um, I worked, you know, I was working an intern in the marketing department there. And then- Oh yes, we'll talk. We'll talk some more <laughs> about this. Yeah. Um, I ended up working um, at Sony Music for a while and then um, worked at the Washington City Paper um, as an arts journalist and then felt like the most, I always, I think I spent a lot of my twenties trying to find one path, which now is ridiculous, um, but because I felt like I was trying to settle on something, film seemed to be the place where I could hold all these interests. And I decided to go to film school and that's how I got to Philadelphia. I went to Temple for my MFA. And you know, one of the challenges that I think I have faced um, in all of the spaces, when I think about stories that I would pitch when I was at City Paper or Freelancer, um, and then when I got to graduate school is just people recognizing um, or not people, <laughs> the gatekeepers and supervisors and people in charge, recognizing that certain stories that I would pitch or that I had developed being valid. And that was something um, as a woman, as a black woman, constantly having to have those arguments. I remember um, my first year of graduate school having two arguments with two of the, one was the chair of the department and the other was just a long-term faculty. And they were so uncomfortable with the results of those conversations that they no longer, they stopped giving me critique after the first semester. And that's absolutely why you go to graduate school. So I feel like I coasted through my MFA, which is not a good thing. And if it weren't for my fellow students, um, my colleagues who were my students and one professor, Michelle Parkerson, I, it would have been a complete wash. Um, wow. But one of the professors told me something that I was like, you know, experimenting with. I was 23 years old, um, trying to experiment with form. And he said it was the worst thing he'd seen in 30 years, right? To a first year, first semester student. Wow. And that was really it was not right. It was so encouraging. And it made me feel, you know, you're already fighting against lack of representation. You know, this I was in graduate school in the early 2000s. Um, so there weren't a lot of, uh, you know, I knew about Julie Dash. I knew about Usan Palsi, but I mean, I, they weren't making work at that time. And so um, it you're already sort of like making something up, you know, there's no touch point for you. And then to be told, <laughs> you know, that this thing you're doing is trash really, really was challenging to me. Um, shout out to him. Yeah. Okay. Shout out. <laughs> and then I had another professor. Um, I had a, we were working in a screenwriting class and um, said to me that this, I was, putting together some story, also first year, not great, but still just trying to develop an idea. And I had put together, um, I have a really, um, uh, really, really diverse family as um, a lot of people do, <laughs> but you know, class and location and religion and all these things. And I didn't feel like I was seeing that in popular culture. And so I wanted to put um, the script together that was gonna have these black women from different backgrounds um, coming together in this one space. And anyway, this professor told me that he, um, that it wasn't real. He told me that it didn't look like, you know, at Temple, he's like, this doesn't look like the black people in North Philadelphia. And so he told me I was making it up. And as a matter of fact, he said, this is Cosby show as if the Cosby show was fiction. Um, and he also was someone, um, and I think the way that I read him in response, he stopped, you know, he just was like, well, you know, here, here's an A and like refused to, um, 
provide any valuable or constructive critique. And so that was my um, experience in graduate school. And I really felt depleted and like, I, or defeated, I guess. And I didn't feel like film was going to be a career for me. And um, in many ways, that's how I ended up becoming a programmer and a curator, a curator, excuse me, and really thinking that um, I was going to be facilitating other people's work um, for a long time. And um, that is a huge challenge. I'm not the only person that I've met with similar, with stories like that. And I think that um, that's something that we have to fight against is just people not seeing your vision or seeing Absolutely. the story that you're bringing as valid. I mean, so many people, you know, who are Arab or indigenous and Latinx and, you know, some executive says to them, well, you know, that they're not fighting, they're not terrorists. This isn't a real story. You know what I mean? Like things like that just yeah. repeatedly happening. And so, but you're making such an important point, Mayori, about, you know, especially for women and, and women of color, you know, being, you know, we're very good at being the the kind of um, executor or of other people's visions, right? But 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 for you to be seen as the visionary mm, and for yeah. you to now be, be doing that, I, I mean, God, if people could just be empowered in that way, if women and women of color could be empowered in that way uh, at a mm -hmm. younger age, you know, how much further along would, yeah. would we be? How much further along would you have been if you had really if your vision had been encouraged by those folks uh, while you were in graduate school. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah thank you, Mayori. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Jean, let's let's hear it. I see that Eagles hat on. Oh yeah, of course. First, I wanna thank y'all for, for having me here. Um, speaking of Eagles, so, I mean, these are my, Aaron and Sarah are really good friends of mine. I was literally at Aaron's house when the Eagles won the Super Bowl. Yes, you were. Uh, we Never forget, them. we were on Broad Street. We Absolutely, <laughs> acting a fool. And Sarah <laughs> is my literal running buddy. We've run like, what, three or four half marathons together. Um, before COVID times, yes. Before, back when we could go outside, back when outside was open. Um, outside. Remember those days? Um, so my career is sort of a hybrid of Aaron's sort of trajectory, the sort of traditional journalism, newspaper trajectory. And also, I'm very much a product of the blogosphere. Um, so uh, I started out at the New York Times, which is kind of the inversion of the way it's supposed to happen, like you're supposed to end up at the time. Um, I started out as an assistant at the New York Times. Um, and I was there for a couple of years when I uh, decided to start a blog back when the blogosphere was a thing. Um, wow. Pop in. Um, I started this blog called Post Bougie, which was really just me and a bunch of my friends sort of blogging about race and culture and politics. Um, and, you know, back then the blogosphere was like this very small space um, and we had some like early champions, other bloggers who were relatively unknown, like this dude named ta Coates who had his little type pad, type pad blog. Um, it was from there. So that, that crew of us, the original Post Bougie crew was like me and Shani Hilton, who's now one of the managing editors at uh, the Los Angeles Times, Jamel Bowie, who was a columnist for the New York Times, uh, Tracy Clayton, who has like a million podcasts. Um, uh, Joel Anderson of ESPN and Slate, we were all just like friends blogging together. Um, but what happened was every time someone got a new job, you know, we would we would solicit pitches and freelance pitches from each other. So we were always putting each other on. Um, and so after a couple of years of, you know, sort of doing the times by day and post Bougie by night, um, Tom Asi Coates, who was then just like getting started as a blogger at the Atlantic, recommend, uh, uh, referenced me to the Huffington Post. They were starting his new Black Voices vertical. Um, he was like, yo, I think you should apply for this. I put your name in. I got that job. I was there for a year and I met um, after a year of being a Huffington Post, which was a great experience. I met Tremaine Lee, who was who literally sat next to me. I was his editor, which is so funny. He's at MSNBC now. Uh, Julie Wilson, who was now at uh, the Cosmo. I mean, she's like the fashion plate person. Um, but like at every step of the way, it was like other black folks in media putting me on. Um, and, and, and it's one of the things I keep thinking about is the extent to which like my story is not scalable because it was just a bunch of black people who like were sort of at hinge points um, at really critical junctures of my career who just yes. sort of put me on um, and said, hey, you should do this thing. And so at NABJ, I met Matt Thompson, who was then at NPR, um, who was then moved on to the Atlantic and has since moved on to um, uh, the Center for Investigative Journalism. Um, and so um, he was starting up this, this new team at NPR uh, called, uh, well, he didn't have a name at the time, but he was basically like, it's gonna be Planet Money, but it's gonna be about race. We don't know what we wanna do, you should apply for it. Um, and I applied for it thinking I wasn't gonna get it because you know, it was like a million people gonna apply, I got it. And that was the team that became Code Switch. Um, and so um, as of next week, it'll be eight years at NPR. Um, uh, we just won 
Apple's uh, first ever podcast of the year, which is banana. In a good run, friends. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I feel old as dirt, but you know, um, one of the things that's so fascinating is, again, like this is in a lot of ways like my dream job um, because it is, you know, it's, it's like all of my fascination is race, it's identity, is power. Um, but in a real way, like you can sort of chart the trajectory of the media industry, a bunch of larger media industry trends just on like what happened in my career, which is sort of the death of the blogosphere, right? The blogosphere being subsumed by mainstream media more broadly, like ta became ta all the people who were blogging with became basically fixtures at mainstream legacy outlets. Jamel ends up at the New York Times, Shani ends up at the LA Times, right? Um, and so um, one of the things that happened is that the, the sort of media landscape became flattened especially at, at least in the national ranks, right? Like, um, and the other thing that happened was this deepening fascination with race in America, right? Um, that was sort of prompted by Obama's presidency. Obviously the black press had always been covering these things, right? The ethnic press had always been interested in these issues of power and identity, but Obama sort of kickstarted this whole different sort of fascination with these things. And obviously like, if you look back on like what race coverage is like in 2010, it was pretty terrible. Um, and it's obviously there's still a lot of ways to go, but like there was to Aaron's point, there was just sort of this atrophied, like there had just been no mainstream attention being really paid to these issues like by newsrooms. And if, you know, when I was at the New York Times, which is like in a really important part of my, my, my story, I learned from, you know, a lot of the best journalists in the country, like, you know, and also that newsroom, like so, like there, and there's no newsroom that does not have this problem, it looks so much different than the city it was in, right? I mean, it's a, it's a newsroom that's overwhelmingly white in a city that is, you know, doesn't have a white plurality, right? Um, you know, it's a, it's a newsroom where, you know, everyone has not just, uh, you know, it's not just college educators, not just professionals, but they are, are by graduates of elite institutions, right? Yeah. Um, that's not what the city looks like, right? And so that changes, you know, the relationship that people in the newsroom have to institutions like policing, institutions like public education, like that, that changes the lens through which you see these things. As somebody who was from a single parent family in South Philly, like, you know, I have like a very different lens that I'm bringing. Um, to a lot of these things, right? Um, and so, I mean, one of the things that's been fascinating to, to sort of echo Aaron's point is that like um, a lot of these things have been assets to me in my career, like a lot of uh, my sort of fascinations and uh, and reporting have sort of, they they sort of just dovetail with this, this deepening fascination with, the, uh, with race in this moment. But I also don't know how scalable that is for so many black journalists, right? Um, um, and that's like one of the things I think we really do need to talk about is um, there still are these giant institutional barriers, right? Um, even if those, some of us have done really well, like one of the things I always talk about is like, you know, I've been working in mainstream institutions for my whole career. With the exception of New York Times, I've always been on non-white teams, right? I was at, the, at Black Voices, we were all black necessarily. In fact, we sat next to Latin, uh, Lat Latino Voices, which is right next to us uh, in the newsroom. We used to always joke that we were the South Bronx because we were the only brown people in the newsroom. Like, and we were all, like all 15 of us were right in the same space. Um, and you could look across the newsroom and it was all white. At, at Code Switch, we're all people of color. So again, like I'm both ensconced in these super white institutions and also I'm not really in these white spaces inside those institutions. So one of the things I always like the caveat here is like, just like my experience is so not scalable and across so many dimensions. Um, but yeah, that's, that's basically my story. Thank you all so much for sharing. I think that was, that was so useful that I actually think I have so many questions for you, but I, we already have great questions in the Q and A. Sure. Um, and one of the questions in the Q and A is very similar to one of the questions I was going to ask. So I think we'll actually jump in to give folks more time for that. One thing I forgot to mention earlier is if folks are following along on Twitter, we do have a hashtag. It's Black Media Makers, obviously Twitter, all one word, hashtag Black Media Makers. Um, okay, so Akila Lacey asked, how do you all combat burnout that comes from being in workplaces that don't recognize anti-Blackness? in your work? And I think this is an interesting question because especially we have Maori here who, you know, founded something um, of her own, right? Um, so there may be some different um, um, examples of this, but what does it look like for you all? And we saw this happen this summer alongside the nationwide uprising for Black Lives, of course, where we saw an increasing number of um, Black media makers speak out about some of the same experiences you all are sharing that 
Maori shared about being discouraged from her projects that, you know, you all have experienced as being sort of maybe the onlys in, in, in newsrooms, right? So how do you um, work through those experiences and, and what do you sort of see as the solution? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, that's part of the reason why, frankly, I decided to start a newsroom. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, uh, and, and look, and not that I love my job. Uh, like I said, that was the job that I wanted since I was 22 years old. Uh, and it was, it was a deeply rewarding uh, role that I had. But, but frankly, I was frustrated last year on the campaign trail. I was seeing uh, the same narratives around race and gender, um, you know, not just where I work but really just across mainstream legacy, uh, you know, political journalism. And, and, and that was frustrating to me because I felt like we had an opportunity for things to be different and they weren't different. And while I could have certainly uh, continued to write about those issues from the platform that I had, uh, it was really, um, you know, I came to believe, uh, you know, just in the early months of the primary that, that race and gender were not just a storyline of 2020, they were the storyline of 2020. And if we were not gonna say that as a politics team, uh, we were missing the story. And so to be able to work uh, in a newsroom where, um, you know, I, I honestly just felt like the best and fastest way to fix the things that were frustrating me was to start over. And, uh, you know, so what that meant, um, because I was our first um, reporter uh, that we hired for all intents and purposes, I mean, my title is editor at large, but I mean, I was out on the primary trail within a week of our launch uh, almost a year ago. Uh, what that meant was, that you know, stories, the themes that I saw as being uh, the themes of this election, that racism was on the ballot, that black women were the backbone of this democracy, that women were gonna be the deciders of this election. Like to be able to say that, not as sidebars, but as the central themes of this election uh, was something that I don't think that I would have been able to do had I not uh, made the step that I made to uh, go to a newsroom that was focused specifically on gender politics and policy. Uh, and to do that uh, through my lens uh, of, of uh, my lived experience as a black woman. Um, and so, you know, I think everything else kind of came out of that. Um, you know, and plan B is, uh, you know, that I talk to my therapist every week without fail, okay? Cause that works. Uh, and, and my therapist helped me to unpack and process, frankly, a lot of the very heavy uh, things uh, that, that we were dealing with even before this pandemic around racism, uh, around, um, you know, um, just the challenges of navigating um, an industry that um, has not done the best job around issues of race or gender, mm. right? Um, and then the other thing is I have a dog. <laughs> that's, that's, that's it. Dogs help everything. Dogs help everything, it's true. Shout out to Ginger. I don't, I don't have an answer for combating burnout, so <laughs> because I, I so I well, have- you got those plants though, Mayor. You got those plants in the background, which are <laughs> do you feel like your decision to, for example, like start Black Star, right? Do you feel like it was it, it was in response, though, to some of these conditions and experiences that you like observed or that, you know, Jean and Aaron are speaking to about the ways in which um, the telling of black stories and even the acknowledgement of the legitimacy of black stories is sort of uh, dismissed in more uh, mainstream in your case, like film spaces? Oh, a thousand percent. Yeah. I mean, I have similar experiences of being the only in different spaces. Um, the one newsroom I was in, I was also the only, but um, in corporate spaces, nonprofit spaces. Um, so there is a fatigue that comes with that. And that's why I'm saying I don't know how to, you know, I've been burned out, <laughs> right? Like in a, a cycle of burnout um, being, I'm, I don't know, I think I might be older than everyone here, but sort of like at the end of uh, Gen X and just sort of expecting um, working in particular fields that you would just have to do double the work, right? Of representation and explaining to people what's happening and then also being like as excellent as possible in your work. Um, Black Star is the second festival that I started. I had a, another festival that I did for two years that was focused on women in film and music, which is a similar set of circumstances to everything Aaron's been saying. And um, 
I didn't intend, because that festival was so stressful, we did it 2007 and 2008, right before the crash. And it was like, you know, young, I was not yet 30, you know, so it was like sort of all volunteer um, and really like crashed and burned in producing it because it was not my full-time job. It was something I was doing on the side mm -hmm. in addition to many other things. And um, I did not think that I was gonna start another festival, um, but the way Black Star came about honestly was because of lack of um, what felt like possibility, um, specifically in Philadelphia. But then we very quickly learned that first festival, this was not just endemic to the city. It was, you know, sort of nationwide or worldwide in the way that we were presenting the work. Um, I think a hallmark of Black Star has been presenting um, work that is often risky and um, sort of blending genre or dealing with politics that other people don't want to deal with, um, presenting, you know, uh, many things that I think we have not always wanted to deal with, even in black spaces, right? Like I, we're not, of course, the first black film festival by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I think the politics that we've brought to it, the kind of intersectionality that we've brought to it um, and the experimentation and this, I'm really interested in investigating. Um, I, I always talk about um, people of color broadly are underrepresented in the media. But of those groups, Black people, we have slight privilege, right? Like a small, small amount of privilege and that we're a little bit more represented than other people. And so for me, um, because there are Black film festivals, there's wonderful ones that have existed for a long time. I wanted to go beyond representation. Representation is absolutely important, but I wanted to have an opportunity to go beyond that and start digging at how would we tell stories if we were in charge? What are the things that we want to do without the white gaze? You know, sort of yes. trying to get to that. And so Black Star comes out of that. Um, but the first year, honestly, I was just planning to do a one day thing. I did not imagine it was going to be a festival about to be, you know, 10 years old. Um, but I looked around at what had not played in Philadelphia, specifically at the Philadelphia Film Festival or any sort of local repertory spaces. And within like two months, I had a list of 30 films that had not played in 2012 and 2011, that first year, including an oversimplification of her beauty by Terrence Nance, right? Which had been at Sundance that year and had not come to Philadelphia. And so, um, that lack of uh, representation, that lack of opportunity, absolutely, you know, is why we're, why we're standing. But also, you know, Mayuri, the conversations that you are able to surface, uh, oh, by the way, I'm an ambassador for Black Star. I, I love the film <laughs> festival. You. I think it's amazing. And, and I think that you're doing the Lord's work by, uh, you know, just continuing to put this on and so long live Black Star. But I mean, seriously, like the conversations that, that some, some of the best events that I went to uh, during the festival were the, the just, um, intersectional conversations. I mean, there was one about black masculinity that was so good a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, they were my friends, but like also it was just super interesting to see that happen. And also just kind of the, uh, what that does for the black imagination, what that does for, you, you know, the, how that conversation could maybe even lead to more work, you know? Um, I, I feel like that is the other part of, of what you are doing to just um, give people the space to, to really think about what that kind of storytelling can look like and to, and, and to give folks uh, permission that they maybe would not get in other spaces uh, to tell some of those kinds of stories. I think it's amazing. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. Jean, I wanna give you a, a chance to answer the question about combating burnout and sort of some of the, the conditions that, that exist for black media makers, but I wonder if I can tie it in to the, the next question um, that got a lot of upvotes in, in our Q&A and that I was hoping to ask you guys also because I think to Maori's point about sort of imagining representation beyond the white gaze and to Aaron's point about black imagination, um, Nikki Thomas asked in the Q&A about the politics of representation and sort of the harm that certain types of visibility and, and then a, a commenter noted, for example, if the only visibility of black folks that we see in the media is increased coverage, but it's always videos of police violence against black bodies and the kind of harm that actually does to black people to only see these sort of negative representations and to black media makers also who have to tell those stories and, and, and contextualize those stories. 
So I wonder if um, we can connect the conversation around the burnout and sort of what types of stories are told and what limitations are to um, expanding, you know, this question of what do we do with the representational politics that has limited the stories in a way that Maori described so that you folks often have to on the front lines push very hard for an expansion of representations of, you know, uh, black sexuality or black joy or black love or other things like that. Which is exactly yeah. what Gene has done with Code Switch, which is yeah. why it's so great. Well, I mean, it's funny because that was literally how I was going to answer the question. Like, um, so Aaron and I were in Ferguson together. Like a lot of people, yes. there was this period between- Speaking of burnout. Yeah, not, exactly, right. So there's a period in 2014 and 2015 when there was, I mean, it's sort of fascinating to watch this happening in 2020 where everyone's like, oh my God, can you believe this is happening? Like we actually did this five years uh, ago. Yeah, we were there. Right. <laughs> Between 2014 and 2015, there was this period in which there was very, like a lot of increased attention um, to, you know, police killings of black people. And, you know, Sarah, you talk about this in your book, like about the way these things get surfaced from like the community level and they become sort of subsumed by mainstream media and how that timeline collapsed, right? Like you look at something like you know, Oscar Grant, and it was like weeks and weeks and weeks. You look at something like Trayvon Martin, and it's like weeks and weeks and weeks. And by the time you get to Mike Brown, it's like within a day. And by the time you get to Philando Castile, she's literally Facebooking live, like from the car, right? Like this timeline collapses. And so one of the things that happened in this, this that sort of stretch was that like the media, both like the people's community media, if you think about people making media like on the street with their phones, um, and mainstream media had gotten really good at, like really efficient at, getting these images, these horrible images of like carnage, of like black carnage, like into the world. And for when that period was like 2014 and maybe even 2016, like um, every time something happened that that hydrant was coming at us, you know what I mean? Like it was like um, every time like something popped off somewhere, right? Like it was someone would like, not just the hashtag would end up in my timeline because people would at me. They'd be like, yo, did you see this? Do you see this? And so it became this thing that I could not turn off right like it was a thing I had to sit in all the time I remember my then girlfriend and wife we were driving through Virginia and we got pulled over this cop and like my heart was it was like we had been in the middle of this right we like we just been in the middle of covering all this my heart was like beating out of my chest you know what I mean like and we had this whole conversation about it later like there's no reason this cop should have stopped this right like we you know what I mean like it was this whole thing right but it's like I was like oh this is this is where it happens this is where the thing happens you know what and I mean so there you are trying to do your job as a black media maker right black stories right and exactly the same kind of violence that you're having to tell stories about and i'm just like and nothing popped off but it's also like the whole exchange was so much more fraught absolutely i mean something popped off because we shouldn't have been stopped but you know what i mean but nothing popped off nothing more egregious than the sort of typical you survived absolutely right another typical sort of unnecessary encounter with that black people have with the police um but like that was something we had to sit in. And, and you know, to Aaron's point, like it I sort of came belatedly to the, the world of therapy. It was become really important to me and it's very cross. We cross we did, we were not processing Ferguson. Like no, we just kept not. going and, we, and, and, and but it but it caught up with all of us. And, absolutely. and I mean it caught up with all of us. Absolutely. Uh, in a way that we in and di it showed up in, in people's lives in different ways. Mm -hmm. Because we mm -hmm. didn't we didn't unpack what that experience meant. And what people would say is when they would tweet at us, right? When they would, they would say, hey. What do you have to say about this? And like, oh, that that's racist. You know what I mean? Like, I don't like, I don't know what it's like. It's horrible. Like, what I mean. And the thing that you would always find is that there's always some sort of, you know, like institutional racism is like snowflakes, right? I mean, it's like like every city has a different sort of, you know, there's like slightly different dimensions to it, but it's all the same stuff, right? Yeah. And so every time something would happen, whether it was Sandra Bland, you know, whether it was you know, um, a Breonna Taylor, like it was always like, what do you have to say about this? Like, well, these are the same set of like. It felt like we were one thing I think that was sort of good at it, good about good in terms of skills was like we were accumulating this knowledge about policing like broadly like we we were had like we were all gaining this because we had to report on policing all the time we had to get, we were right. all collectively on our team and elsewhere but and even starting from the premise that we absolutely. understood that this could be absolutely right legitimate, right Which absolutely is right it's a lot of gatekeepers like that that honestly feels like the uh, to the extent that there is a difference between kind of the emerging Black Lives Matter movement in 2014 and the moment that mm -hmm. we find ourselves in now, um, you know, it's not as hard of a sell that maybe all police are not, you know, here to protect uh, Black and Brown folks uh, mm -hmm. in their communities all the time, right? Like maybe you can you can say, well, yeah, this this maybe could have happened, and maybe we shouldn't just accept the police report on its face anymore. Absolutely, um, I mean, and this is like, and that's like an institutional problem with American journalism, right? Like, yes. so Aaron comes out of newspapers, I come out of newspapers, right? Like, one of the things that happened really early in your career, if you were a cub reporter, 
but they put you in the cop shop, right? There yes. was a thing you had to do. Like you went, you sat literally in the police station sometimes. You were embedded with the police. Yeah. Um, and you were just writing up police reports, basically. Like this is the, and, and the version of events that you almost always got was the police version of events. Like if Absolutely. you look at the times, I think they Which sort of- you were expected to, to use to do your exactly. story. Authority said, blah, 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 right? And that was, and like the thing that we all know, like the thing we all know is that like cops lie as a matter of course, not even like, like sometimes, like they lie as a matter of course, because every police stop has to be justified. And every police stop, most police stops are not justified. But when they, when those police stops are recorded, they always have some reason, some rationale for that stop, right? And that's the kind of thing that we all understand. I think mm -hmm. like the broader media universe is starting to understand, but like that's, that's like embedding people with the cops is like one of these sort of fatal flaws in newspaper reporting about policing from the beginning. It's like one of the, and it, of course, for us, for those of us who have had unfortunate encounters with the police, like that skepticism is like, we, we have that sort of um, baked into us. But you gotta remember that like for most Americans, most white Americans, um, the contact they have with the police is mediated, right? It's like, it's entertainment media. It's, it's you know, it's, it's and so like the, the idea that the premises of policing are faulty, right? Like that they are, that they might, they are fundamentally racist. It's like an idea that like it, it it is hard to get into the discourse because the people who are most invested in policing don't have any sort of like material contact with policing, right? They're not on the business end of policing. And so, and the people, those of us who do, who are, who, or who have more proximity to the business end of policing um, are not in, like we're not in the news media, right? Like we just generally are not, um, even though there are more of us, right? There's no newsroom in the country that I think at, at any major news outlet that is remotely representative of the American populace, right? Um, and so these stories around policing um, and these sort of cred credulity extended to the police um, uh, was like a part of the part of the trauma of covering these things, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. I'm not gonna curse, but like, you know, copy on some, you know what I mean? Like, and so, and to like, that was a thing that you have to sort of like fight to say, which is sort of plain and clear and true and like numerically provable. Yeah. Um, but um, part of the thing is like, this sucks. And I don't want to have to talk about all the yes. things in Walter Scott's life. Right? And it was un and it was unrelenting. And and yes. so like it matters that folks like you or I or Maori are able to we are now in positions to be able to make different choices about mm -hmm. the yes. kind of stories that we are going and to I, tell about yeah. black folks. And and frankly, look, this was among the suggestions of the Kerner Commission, right? Like cover yes, the absolutely. totality of black life. Mm -hmm. Cover black people holistically mm -hmm. as opposed to just, you know, in terms of crisis or in response to trauma. And, mm. and maybe, you know, we can we can show uh, folks dignity and humanity, right? right. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, uh, centering Black joy, for example, in the midst of a pandemic and a super consequential election, uh, you know, takes, uh, yes, we report on voter suppression, but yes, we also focus on, you know, the folks who are galvanizing and mobilizing people and, and showing them, you know, that they have power and, 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 and you know, making, you know, a voter registration drive festive as opposed to, you know, a doomsday, uh, mm -hmm. you know, scene, which, uh, you know, might be the inclination of somebody who doesn't necessarily look like us or who isn't, you know, you know, led into these um, spaces to, to tell those kinds of stories. Um, yeah, I mean, or, or, or just any, any of the good things that have happened, yeah. uh, you know, two and four Black folks in, in, in the past, uh, you know, four to 12 years, depending on how far back you want to go. Um, you know, uh, th th there are choices uh, that, that folks are making about the kinds of stories that we are telling about us. Um, yeah. And, you know, for those of us who are pushing back and saying, no, like we will not just focus on this, we will also uh, focus on these stories, I, I think has been hugely important. And, and especially as you increasingly have um, people like us who are in positions to center those narratives as well. Absolutely. So I wonder if, um, because that that really speaks to some of the follow-up questions on that question about the politics of representation, you all now, all three of you, I would say, are leaders in, in, in your perspective areas. And do you feel that, you know, this, someone asked about the right of refusal, like can Black media makers, particularly those coming up, right, refuse, say, I, you know, I'm not going to just cover these stories that are about, you know, Black death and Black oppression, but in fact, I want to tell these nuanced, complex, beautiful stories about Black love or Black joy or celebration, or do you feel like that's something that you had to actually 
um, get to a point, you know, where you had, you, you had the autonomy to do that. And if so, like, what do you think, you know, the solution for that is for folks who don't want to go through that same thing that you all are talking about, the trauma, you know? Yeah. Um, listen, it, 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 I will not lie. It, it, it is, it is, it can be a challenge earlier on in your career to convince your editors um, that these are stories worth telling, but, but, but that does not mean that they are not. It just means that uh, you probably have a harder case to make uh, to them that, that these, these are stories that should be told. But listen, I mean, just as we tell stories of white people who are triumphing and uh, you know, overcoming and, uh, you know, uh, whatever, like, like, like why, why should we not be telling those stories about the black and brown folks who are in this country, right? I mean, we tell them because they are good stories. It's just a matter of who we say, you know, is worthy of that kind of storytelling. Uh, but like universal themes, you sh I mean, those, those are like eternal in journalism. Right, it's just it's just we make a choice about who gets to um, be the the protagonist in those stories, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I think that that um, but but there's absolutely a case to be made, uh, and I think uh, there's always going to be room for for good journalism, uh, no matter who it's about. There's probably more avenues um, that that's that true too themselves of as well, right? Like so, I mean, depending on what the sort of clauses of your contract or your employment situation are if you can't write it for your outlet for the the outlet that pays your bills you know full time like there are other ways to do that you can, you can write stories you know you can freelance you can write stories to other outlets i mean there's other ways to do to tell these stories right because one of the things that's that i, I found so liberating about, about being a code switch is that we get to tell stories about black people that are just messy like that are not about like catastrophe right like but they are still messy right like you know just like um a, a black woman voter who was a left-leaning voter and her mom was more conservative voter just be beefing like you know like lovingly beefing over who they're going to vote for like there's all these complications in black life um um that don't get told because everything like Aaron was saying like the sort of themes of journalism are you know conflict novelty right like um conflict is it, it, when it comes to black people is always like being destroyed like being obliterated right um but there are so much more like other fascinating yes. conflicts happening among black people um, that don't have anything to do with white people directly, right? I mean, we all live under the age of white supremacy, but a lot of caveats, caveats, caveats. But like, you know what I mean? Like uh, there are all these like universes that are worth exploring, you know what I mean? Like, you know, um, and that um, that are like full of like fascinating characters and fascinating tensions, you know, that don't have to do with um, with like racism. <laughs> at the top line thing. Um, and there are other places to tell them, right, than just the outlets that we are, that mm -hmm. maybe our primary employers. And I think maybe we should, like, if you can, you might want to avail yourself of either pitching other places or even like, I mean, I mean, there's, we are sort of, some of the ironies of um, media being like a much less profitable place is like we're in this golden age of long form journalism. There are places yeah. um, where there are other ways to tell stories than the sort of traditional like outlets um, mm -hmm. and platforms. That a lot yeah, of and I think Mary was gonna, you were gonna speak a bit to this, right? Oh, just a little bit. I mean, I think um, for people who are early in their careers in film and television, I think the stakes are slightly different um, in terms of availability of work. Um, and so I know mm -hmm. definitely for a lot of actors and also for emerging directors, and screenwriters that they feel pressure to take whatever job is there. Because I think for everyone in the film industry, it you know, exists in a scarcity model, right? So you think that this is the only job that you might have all year. And so it's challenging to you know, turn it down or not take that opportunity. And so um, I have noticed that some people who I admire, who've been able to kind of be very specific about the careers that they're gonna take, I think about, you know, may rest in peace, like Chadwick Boseman made very specific choices in the characters he was going to play, but he did that at a cost to himself, right? And in his early career, I mean, no one knows when he was like, you know, struggling and not taking thug number one, number two, you know, that other people take, took, right? Law and order stabber. 
Right. And you can't really knock people for taking those roles because those are the roles that are available. And if you want to, you know, in order to join, to get into the industries, to get the other jobs, you have to have a certain amount of jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's because of capitalism has this way of perpetuating itself and um, forcing people to, to be in those things. I'm um, always trying to encourage people, however, not when it's early in your career, but you know, when you do have the option, I think about Steve McQueen's small acts, right? Which is I'm really enjoying, but I think about, we look at his career, he didn't start off with you know, telling a black film necessarily. And he brought, you know, he got all these accolades, he's been practicing, and now he's telling, you know, this incredibly like layered and nuanced series of stories about Black people in the UK. And it's the reverse of what we usually do in the US. Mm -hmm. People usually feel like they have to tell, you know, whatever Black story they have in their hearts, they feel like that has to be their calling card. And I wish that we could actually, not necessarily mimic Steve McQueen, but, um, I, I wish that there was more freedom. I find so many filmmakers that I've taught, um, you know, students that I've taught, and then watching filmmakers come through the festivals, excuse me, through the festival circuit. It's it's there's it's um it's a really I have to say, say this with a lot of nuance because of course people want to tell their stories, and those are often stories about people that look like them and come from their own backgrounds. But sometimes people want to tell other kinds of stories and they don't feel like they have permission to do so. And so I, I wish that we had more freedom to do that, to not pitch a black story, <laughs> you know, to not pitch yes. not only about black trauma, but maybe not black at all. You know, maybe you want to adapt. Uh, eat, pray, love, you know, yeah. and you what story be, would you tell if, if, if race was not something that was at the forefront of your mind at all times? Right, right. Yeah. And I feel like we um, not only are we not given permission to do that by the gatekeepers, but I feel like racism has really worked because we don't even give ourselves that permission mm -hmm. to even think about it or yeah. to attempt to ask. And so that was, the, that was what was going through my mind when the question was posed, because there on the one hand is a real economic implication and also mm -hmm. resume building implication. Mm -hmm. Um, but then there's also at a certain point when you have a little bit more leverage that people still don't take it because then, you know, other things are at stake. Um, and I'm really admiring the people who keep it in their hearts to like, as soon as they can, you know, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna, um, you know, I think even thinking about Dave Chappelle, like we laugh at him, but Chappelle's story is exactly like, I'm not gonna play this game in this way anymore. Mm -hmm. um, not wow. yeah. yeah, thank Larry, you. I will tell you, I'm having, I'm just listening to you. I'm having a serious breakthrough. I just realized for anybody here who's listening to to this or who's watching this, who's following me on Twitter, like you may know that I occasionally uh, rage tweet about Peppa Pig. This is this is why I love Peppa Pig. I do not have to think about being a black person for the entire 30 minutes that I'm watching. <laughs> it is, I mean, I am so furious about what a bad toddler she is that I literally get to take a break from being uh, black and racism for, uh, you know, half an hour. What a gift. I, I've, I've had it all wrong here. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to thank Peppa for uh, her contribution now, instead of trashing her as, as a, a bad person, pig, animal. <laughs> this is great all, thank you. So we have five minutes left of this panel um, and I, we have so many great questions um, that it is really hard to choose from them all. We have a lot of questions um, from students and industry people asking, um, essentially, um, this, you know, the students are asking about your, how you were resilient and, and pushed back against and came through some of the pushback that you got from maybe uh, journalism or film professors. We have some industry folks interested in what the industry should be doing differently so that, um, you know, uh, black media makers coming up maybe don't face the same kind of like editorial censorship or um, anti-blackness that some of, some of you all faced. Um, I also wanted to ask you what you think the most pressing issues or stories of the moment are that the media should be doing better on, um, both in terms of creative, uh, you know, storytelling and in terms of journalistic storytelling. So I will just throw all that out and let you take whichever one, you know, you feel um, resonates. <laughs> I know it's a lot. There's so many good questions. I know it's like a lightning round up in here. Um, I'm thinking about there's two things I want to say. There was one point that I wrote, I think earlier too. It's really important for us to 
Um, going back to the issue of sort of having people in the newsroom or Aaron's ability to create a newsroom or Jean to have a show, um, you know, where you're creating your staff. And I, I think about On the Rocks, which is Sofia Coppola's new film. Um, and I believe Rashida Jones is one of the producers, but if she wasn't, there are so many moments in that film where it is clear that she took some control. And um, you, Jean telling the story about being pulled over by the cops, I think that scene where Bill Murray and Rashida Jones' character gets pulled over by the cops, you know that Rashida like stepped yeah. in to say, Right, right, right. That scene was going to happen. And I, so that's such a small like example, but having people in the room for all the different things, if it's the classroom, the writer's room, the newsroom, et cetera, to me, that's what's really pressing. Having people in the room to like punch holes in things um, makes the story, whatever the story is, that much stronger. Um, so I think that's something that I'm really advocating for and is important to me. And then I think I just want us more, more and more to be talking about the environment and to be uh, promoting truth telling <laughs> because I think that is, if there is any damage from the last four years, it has been just this, everyone's like, their faith has been rocked and it's been rocked with just the most Gemini of Gemini actions um, in this administration. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> I want to close on what uh, Mary said about uh, having people in the newsroom, but I also would just strongly advocate for the importance of having your people broadly. Like it has been immensely important to me personally to have a, a just a friend circle that is made up of black journalists, right? Um, um, just because there's, there's those people who can like be sounding boards for like editorial ideas. Like, does it make sense? Does this whole water like, um, but also just like you have people to vent to, right? Um, like, I think a lot of us come from families where it's like, you know, like my mom, I'm still not exactly clear. She knows what I do. You know what I mean? Like, no, you know, they, de they definitely don't know what I'm right? right. You know what I mean? So it's like, my mom thinks I'm a yoga teacher. <laughs> <laughs> My, my mom just needs to know what time I'm going to be on MSNBC. So yeah, that's, that's exactly me. right. Like, oh, I, I told the yeah. church that you go. Aaron's on television again. I was like, we did a live show with the Apollo, and I still don't think that my mom quite understood what I did. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know how I, I work at the 19th, but. Thing, like, legit, but, I, um, but like, really, like, having a universe of people, of other Black journalists, like, um, NABJ um, is the National Association of Black Journalists, has um, given me like sort of informally, like a lot of my closest friends are people that I met there in passing, um, um, who have just been like, you know, like my, some of my like best friends, you know, in some cases, like literally like, the, you know, the best people at my wedding, you know, but like, um, like just having a universe of people to be like, look, this, what are you working on? What I'm working, like just the, cause you can sort of have these conversations in real life outside of the context of the newsroom. And also just like to vent about the sort of, again, like the hydrant we're talking about, you know what I mean? Like, um, um, I think it's just really hard to, it, it, it's really hard to explain like what it is we do. And like, there's things that I, that I can't say, right. Like that I like, like just professionally, I'm not allowed to say that I think it's just useful to have other people who understand what those constraints are. Right. Like, you know, just to understand like sort of how journalism works and what the ethics are like, and, and sort of things that I like, that are like, that's not like things I won't comment on. Like this is going beyond my reporting. A lot of people are like, why won't you say this? Like, I'm not just on here popping off. Like I have to report, like, you know, it's like- The well, way my direct deposit is set up. <laughs> like, I just like as a, as a responsible sort of like, you know, um, uh, like synthesizer of information. Like there are things I can't say, like, like, um, and it's just like useful to have other people who understand sort of these, these like foundational tenets of, of journalism. Um, um, and just to like to just to push you, and so I just think that like just for like for self care reasons, for just like editorial reasons, get you uh, find the people. You know what I mean? This does not apply to Jean's Twitter feed, by the way. Oh no! Uh, <laughs> no, but look, it, it's not too late to accept uh, to the suggestions of the Kerner Commission. We can implement those at any time. It's it's time to do that. And, and right. honestly, for newsrooms that you know got an awakening <laughs> during this racial reckoning, keep going. Yeah. Keep going. We are at the beginning of this journey. This was not just about this summer. This is about everything. And, um, you know, folks still have work to do, right? I mean, things are beginning to change. And, and hopefully uh, that is something that will be sustained uh, and that we won't find ourselves, you know, having another reckoning uh, of, about the same stuff that, that we could have addressed in this moment, yeah. uh, you know, five, 10 years from now. The uh, and then the other thing, years ago, you know, right? and the same stuff. If we're talking about yeah. the same stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Like, I mean, the founders of NABJ, I mean, we're recognizing our 45th anniversary this weekend. 
you know, and, and, and the founders, many of whom are still with us, uh, will, will say, uh, you know, I'm sorry that you're having to write about, frankly, the same shit you, you know, that we had to write about uh, when we started. You're, you're fighting the same battles in your newsroom uh, that we were fighting, even though there were less of us. Like, why is that? They, they, I mean, they, they lament that. Um, and so that's real. So let's not be in this position in 45 years uh, from now. But then the other thing is, look, this pandemic is going on. Um, the reopening uh, is also uh, racist, frankly. Uh, it's unequal. We need to stay on top of that uh, so that people understand that, that we are uh, the folks that are being disproportionately uh, on the front lines and, and dying of this. And, and so to continue to tell those stories, uh, but also how we are responding to uh, the pandemic, I, I think is very important. Yeah, well, thank you all so much. This has been amazing. I wish, you know, if we had done this in person, we could keep talking. That's the thing you lose with the Zoom is like the breaks where you get to chat and people yeah. can ask their questions one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but folks can find all of you in all the places that you are, uh, Twitter, Instagram, your websites, you know, et cetera. Um, and so with that, I just want to thank the three of you. I think this was such a fabulous start, such an honor to have you. Um, and we are going to give you a moment to sort of turn off and then I will introduce our panelists for the next session. And for, for those hanging in, our next session is specifically about activism and protest in relation to Black Lives Matter and sort of the things that um, Black media makers have, have faced. So we'll be talking more about some of those things that, that came up in, in this session as well. Thank you all three. Be easy. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe, everybody.